going to talk about optimization problem on space of functions with second order bounded variation. Okay, I think that, that was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, congratulations. So thank you very much, Camilla. Thank you very much for the introduction. And of course, also for the hospitality here. It's really wonderful. So this is the outline of the talk that you have, you have already seen. So uh, let me start with the first part. So the motivation, the reason for this section, maybe there are two reasons. The first is that I want to give a, a real motivation for this study because otherwise it might seem a bit unnatural. This kind of problem. So I want to tell you why this really arises in, uh, when solving problems coming from the real world. And the second part of this first section will be about uh, a couple of examples. And I'm going to need these examples because later on I need to make a guess in a theorem. And so this will be useful to build intuition and try to get the right guess of the relevant function spaces. So, okay, so this is how everything started. So, uh, uh, Cheyenne uh, and Michael uh, were working about inverse problems. So, an inverse problem is uh, when you want to reconstruct a causal factor starting from the noise, possibly noisy observation that, uh, that you can measure. And actually, they were working in the field of uh, image uh, uh, reconstruction. So, that may be the, the right example to keep in mind. So, the problem is that you have some measurements and you want to reconstruct an image that is compatible with that, but in a sensible way. Well, so, which one of these is the noise and which is the signal here? Yeah, I'm going to... Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, put in mathematical terms, you can maybe put it in the calculus operation framework. So, the problem becomes a problem of minimization. So, over a, an appropriate function space, you want to minimize this function. And uh, here there are, there are more terms. So the first is the error functional. So it's the one that keeps your guess close to the data that you, that you have observed. So you have to, you don't want to have much discrepancy with the data that you, you already had. But adding only this error term is something that it's, you really do not want to do. And the reason is that if you have only the error term, your problem will be um, clearly imposed. That's because you have finitely many observations you usually have an infinite dimensional source space. So you would be affected to overfitting. The problem would be really unstable. And so the outcome would be somehow terrible. And so what people in the applied community do is to have a regularization function. And that makes the problem much more uh, treatable and much more meaningful. But uh, not only it uh, alleviates the imposedness, but allows also you to impose some prior knowledge on the on on the, the image, for example, that you want to to reconstruct. Okay, let me say that today this uh, regularization term is will be a uh, will be always a a seminar. Okay, then you have two terms. You want to regulate maybe the interplay between them, so you need three parameter that today will not be important. Maybe the experts will, will give you the right value. Okay, so this was the was the problem that. Uh, Cheyenne and uh, Mikael wanted to study and ask us. Uh, they get a particular instance, but let me keep things from, from a general perspective now, also because nothing will be rigorous in this, uh, in this first section. And okay, so the first thing, uh, let me denote in this way with N, the null space of the seminar that gives the regularization term. And this is because these are the things that in the end you don't care. And okay, now, what is important here is to recall the theorem that is really used in the their field, and it's called the representer theorem. So it tells you that uh, you can represent a minimizer of the inverse problem, so the uh, variation problem that was in the uh, slide before, as a linear combination of extremal point of this set. So this set is a, is a convex set because this is a seminorm. And so you want to take the extremal points using the usual notion of uh, coming from complex uh, analysis. So uh, let me say that a point, a uh, function G is not an extremal point if it can be written as a non-trivial complex combination of functions belonging to that space. So in other words, uh, extremal points are the ones that cannot be written as a non-trivial uh, uh, complex combination here. Yeah, what is interesting here, I mean, what makes this useful is that you take a, 
uh, linear combination, you take finitely many terms, but the number of terms that you have to take is bounded and depends only on the shape of the error term, not on the values of the measurements that you had. So uh, this is the reason why this is appreciated. And this is the reason also why the YASD the YASC does to study the extremal points of uh, of this. Any kind of convective here? Right. So the gamma i is just completely free, or is it the gamma? I mean, I do not care. I just want to, to tell you that studying the extremal points of this is uh, is interesting. So the gamma i usually uh, the, the, this is not a complex combination. Okay. Uh, if that was your question. Yes. I mean, like. The, this is not. I can push you out. Right? Yes. Uh, uh, the fidelity yes. term could push yes. you out of this, the... this is a linear combination. So the linear combination, but what's important is that you have few elements representing it. So you have P uh, values to take uh, into consideration. And you're starting from an uh, infinite dimensional function spaces. Just one question. Can you give us an example? Any example? Because I think I'm missing something about the function E, the error function. Okay. For example, so uh, yes. So you have to keep in mind the problem of uh, uh, image reconstruction. So maybe you are in R2, uh, you have your face, face of functions, and the E of F can be something like sum I F X I minus. Y i, y i is equal to one to one. Of course, you have to make assumptions so that you want this to be well posed. But uh, so right, so you have these measurements, and you want you so it's really to... discrete. It's a discrete card. Uh, yes, usually yes. Uh... <laughs> ah, yes, but I mean they, they are interested only in this kind of. Uh... Okay, they're really discrete sets. Yes. <clears throat> And is it like the modulus or the square? Uh, different kind of, I mean, you are taking right a norm, a norm over there. You can uh, take uh, maybe the L1 norm, the LP norm. So they, okay, they, they, choices. they lead to different choices. But uh, maybe this one, uh, when you are in, in the plane, this is uh, going to be a, a good outcome. They do not change so much in the end. Okay. One more question. And for example, so if I'm getting something right, an example of R would be. Uh, that would be the main topic of the talk. Uh, okay, so this is an example of R, but uh, okay, so uh, this is going towards the, the real choice of R. So this is simple. So you take a uh, function going from the Euclidean space to, uh, to the, the real numbers. And the regularization function is the total variation of the function. So this is the usual total variation of BD functions. Null space here is uh, constant functions. Um, but OK, so you want to study the extremal point of this set, the regularization ball. And now let me do not discuss about uh, maybe compactness or something like this. But uh, uh, what it turns out is that the extremal points of this set so the extremal point of the set of functions whose total variation is more radical than, uh, than one are weighted characteristic function of sets of finite perimeter. You can realize that they, they belong to this with the uh, quaria. But of, of course, in order to have a set or characteristic of a function of set of finite perimeter to be an extremal uh, point, you'd need some assumption on the set of finite perimeter. So for example, you want it connected. You want its uh, complementar set to be connected, and you have to phrase it in a GMT way. And uh, well, the definition is simple. So simple means that the set is in the composable for this one of these, and also its complementar set uh, is decomposable. And, and the composability would mean I cannot write it as the sum of two individual yes. functions, so which so then the sum of the yes. perimeters is equal to the yes. perimeter. Yes, of yes, sum of yes. Two you don't want to have it in the more like, like two pieces. Yes, that, that's not good, right? That's not good. right. But even the complement has to. Have yes, because if you have a hole, you can fill the hole. Ah, uh, because it's the module thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's... Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, this is uh, this is something known, and uh, okay. What is important to notice that uh, uh, this uh, regularization function comes from a measure, <clears throat> and the extremal points. Are the one whose associated measure is as sparse as it can be. So it's supported in a one two dimensional subspace, and they are kind of irregular functions, but their 
associated measure is uh, sparse and that's what maybe people from the applied side uh, like. And okay, second example, uh, let me treat only functions of real variable, but now I take the second order, uh, this uh, second order derivative. So this is more or less the total variation of the second derivative uh, of the function. Here, the null space is made of uh, uh, affine functions. And okay, this set is particularly nice because uh, if you write the regularization ball, the ball with respect to the regularization function, then of course, discarding affine terms, you have an isomorphism with the space of signed measure uh, with a bound on the total variation. So going from right to left, just take two derivatives and you're gonna have a measure in this set. From left to right, you have to do a double integration. So you're using prime for the first derivative? Yeah, there is, a one. there is a, I mean, if you have a second order distributional derivative, then the first one is, uh, okay. is, is, is a function. So prime is the convention because it's a classical differential and not a distribution. Yes, because uh, th there will be some comments about this because I'm going to investigate in higher dimension here on the domain. But the fact is, if you want, you can take directly the second order distributional derivative and it's fine. But if you have it, then it turns out that the first uh, distributional derivative is a function with some integrability. Okay, so you want to study the extremal points of this set, but maybe it's better to study the extremal points of this set. You know this, and these are uh, direct deltas. So you retranslate it in the original framework, and you happen to have these kind of functions. So if you, you will have something like this. So this is the point x zero, and then you have this. Again, uh, the regularization function is a, is given by a measure, and the measure on the extremal points is very sparse. So you drop the measure on the second, which is uh, supported. And let me notice that these functions uh, are uh, uh, piecewise uh, uh, affine or piecewise linear. So this is just for some, some example. But uh, now all the talk would be uh, with a fixed uh, regularization function. Let me introduce it. First, there is the space. Uh, this is the space of functions with bounded action. Uh, the name comes uh, from uh, a paper by the MNG, uh, a rather old paper, but it was interested with uh, uh, different things. Okay, so let me define the space of functions with bounded action, and more or less one should think about the functions with uh, second order uh, distributional derivatives, uh, which are measures, and so this is a second order version of the BB space. Let me frame it rigorously. So we say that a function has bounded action if it's locally Sobolev and its partial derivatives are locally BV. And if you compute the total variation of these uh, uh, distributional derivatives of the partial derivatives, you end up with a finite number. So, okay, maybe it seems unnatural to put the log subscript here. And the only reason is that if omega is unbounded, I want to have a fine functions in it, affine functions are not integrable. So this is uh, some sort I'm forced to do, to take this local version of the spaces. But if omega is bounded, just uh, forget about this. So the, the only reason is that I want really to have uh, affine functions to be in, uh, in this space. So just one question, like, uh, I might be missing something. You say DIF is BB lock. But then it's actually BV. No, because uh, I mean, with the BV definition, you usually ask integrability of the function. Depends on your definition, but for me, a BV function is a one. Yeah. Ah, I see. So th that's the only reason, but you got the point. And also regarding, like, in general, like, okay, all of this, this is to say that the Hessian is a measure in the sense of. Yes, exactly. That's the only thing you're saying. Yes, that's important. That's and okay, keep in mind that if the action is a measure, then you have also these, uh, these kind of things because you can iterate some sober and version and so some easy things. Okay, so a couple of consequences, consequences of this uh, in higher dimension. So here I'm working in RD, in a domain in RD. You can iterate the sober and embedding uh, modular sum approximation, and it turns out that functions in the space of functions that have bounded action variation are integrable with. Uh, uh, good integrability. In dimension equal to one, uh, we know because there is the example before, right? So they are uh, uh, lip. And uh, so this is uh, easy and 
I'm going to forget about the one dimensional case later on. And the case is equal to two uh, is the critical case for the sub 11 embedding. And uh, you cannot prove quantitatively an L infinity bound, but it turns out that these functions are continuous. And this, this proof is, the, is in the paper of the measure. And uh, it's an elementary proof, but uh, quite smart. And, uh, but it's true. So that's the reason maybe why I was in a room. I wanted to state that problem in, in R2, right? Because if I take this regularization function, then functions having finite second order variation seminar are continuous, and so I can evaluate them at, uh, at some point. So otherwise, you can you want maybe to have some diffuse uh, measurements. <coughs> okay, so this was basic properties. Uh, okay, so you have a functions with bound direction, then uh, uh, it means by definition that it's gradient is a vector valid DV function, so you can take its distributional differential. Let me denote it in, uh, in this way, so that was maybe becoming a question of, uh, of before. So this is a matrix valued measure. Now you want to take the total variation of a matrix valued measure, so it's important to uh, decide which matrix norm you should uh, take. And here it came the, the idea coming from the applied community. So what one usually does is to use the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of matrices. So it means that you sum the squares of the entries and take the square root. And th this leads to this uh, total variation. Maybe that's not a good choice, this, this notation, but uh, I realized it yesterday, so I do not want to change it, but uh, let me do it too. <laughs> yeah, because this two may be, this is not an operator norm, this is just uh, the Frobenius norm of a matrix. And this is what, uh, I mean, if your matrix becomes a vector, in the Euclidean space, this is an L2 norm. So this is not so unreasonable as an addition. <laughs> and okay, this is uh, maybe 90% of the cases people use this and it's implicitly used uh, usually. But uh, we won't take this uh, uh, norm and later on I'll give you an example of why it's not a good idea. And so uh, I'm taking, I'm going to take the total variation with respect to the shuttle norm. Uh, the shuttle norm of a matrix let me state it only for symmetric matrices because it's uh, uh, a bit easier. So take a symmetric matrix, take its eigenvalues, and sum their uh, mod moduli. This uh, will result in the uh, total variation computed with respect to the shuttle norm. And this is the Hessian shuttle total variation. So for you, it's always the one shuttle. Yeah. Yes, for me, it's only the one shuttle norm. Not other. Yes, the other have the same problem with. Uh, Later on, there will be a density result. So you can realize that having a density result in energy with respect to this norm would be too strong because of the Schechner theorems, but also the other shutter norms are not good. Yeah. OK, uh, just for uh, uh, just a, um, an equation to compute maybe in some more familiar terms the total variation with respect to the shutter norm. This is a matrix valued measure, so you can write uh, it's polar decomposition with respect to the Frobenius uh, norm. Here there is the polar matrix. The polar matrix is a matrix field whose uh, Euclidean whose Frobenius norm is uh, uh, always one. And then just take its shuttle norm and you can compute it. the second order total variation with respect to the Frobenius norm. A uh, couple of basic properties. These are really easy. And uh, maybe the, the things that to, to recall from this slide is that uh, the properties that you know for the space BV hold also uh, with the suitable adaptation in this uh, second order framework. Okay, first, take an open set, then the second order total variation with respect to the shaft norm is a semi norm. Okay, this is expected. You can represent it by duality via integration by parts. So, so, so maybe there's an important thing that I'm totally missing. This, this shaft norm, is not equivalent to, to the L1 norm of the entries. So. No. Wait, the size of the I mean, equivalent, what do you mean? Uh, up to constant. Well, uh, uh, I mean, the the so everything is equivalent. Yeah. Then, I, then I'm truly not getting. So here we are just having still again bound validation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the space, space is the same. Oh, okay. The norm is different. Can go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's important that it's different. And uh, uh, there is a slide with a counterexample. Uh, so uh, 
This is as you're minimizing, minimizing the function, or of course, it does matter which precise line. Yeah, there is a right? big difference. Oh, I see. Uh, Okay, you can represent it by duality, so kind of integration by parts. Uh, it's lower semi-continuous with respect to L1 uh, convergence. Everything is it's obvious. There is a Meyer certain type result, so density in energy of smooth function. So if you take a function with bounded action, you can approximate it in L1 with smooth function, but with the con right convergence of the <laughs> seminar. Now that you have uh, uh, that is a semi-norm that you have lower semi-continuity, so you can behave that uh, you can do the usual operations of uh, pollution or uh, <laughs> averaging, uh, and you have the behavior that you expect. This is the exact same behavior that you have with uh, the function. So I'm not going to to state it, but yeah. and all of these properties would all more or less also uh, they would all also for the Hilbert norm, and they would also for the L1 norm of the entries. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, I defined this. It took quite a while to define this, this object, so I want to use it. And this is going to be the choice of the regularization uh, function. And uh, okay, now there is why. So why one has to take this? Uh, I'll give you a rigorous uh, motivation later on, but uh, let me tell you. Uh, so you can realize it. Uh, you want to study the extremal points of the regularization goal. So, okay, let's, okay, of this set. So you want to study the extremal points. So if you want to study extremal points, you don't want them, them to be too much. So if you take a strictly convex norm, probably won't be a good idea. So you want the norm to be as less round as possible. So that maybe uh, gives you uh, Tells you that maybe taking some sort of L2 norm is worse than taking an L1 norm, but this is, of course, not rigorous. And also, you want to have a norm that is, uh, I mean, among the usual norms, you want to have the uh, biggest one. And uh, uh, we'll see why, why later. But OK, so we can also think that uh, people from the applied community asked us to use this, uh, this norm. So we have to do this. OK, so the null space is a fine functions. And this is the object of the investigation. Of course, we forget about a fine function. It rigorously, one uh, should really take the quotient to do some, uh, some analysis. But let me keep things not so rigorous from this uh, point of view. OK, a simple remark. Uh, if the space is one dimensional, it's back to the second example of today. We know this space. We know the extremal point of this regularization ball. And these are the ones. So in the following. Uh, uh, the dimension would be implicitly uh, bigger than them too, so from the plane. Okay, so one wants to have a guess for this space. Uh, maybe one can take the motivation from this. So uh, extremal points are functions with a piecewise uh, affine. So I want to define a concept of fun functions that are piecewise affine also in uh, higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. And this is uh, easy, but let me give the notation of the triangulation that is going to be used to define uh, piecewise affine functions. So on RD, uh, on RD, a triangulation is a pair, is a couple of sets. One is the set of vertices, and the, one, the other one is the set of elements. What is important here, uh, to be honest, is to, record the, to, to choose the right set of elements, but it plays a role also to think about this triangulation in terms of both, set, of both vertices and elements. So the properties of a triangulation is that uh, uh, elements are simplexes uh, and uh, the uh, vertices of the simplexes are. So B is a single point? B is a set of vertices. And are triangular E is being edges? E is elements. I, what's elements? Is it? Elements? Uh, no, they are They're going to be the same. Ties. Ties. Okay. The tiles. Okay. I think. Yes. Uh, it's tiles. Uh, so, so S triangles in a two. Yes. So let, let me draw it, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it, they do come in pairs. Not that for every vertex there's an element. Or yes. For every vertex, there are there is more than one element. Okay. So for example, I, I'm triangulating the blackboard in this way, right? So these are the elements. Okay. And these are the vertices. Okay. 
So you see that a vertex there are an element is a simplex and this the convex hull. So the second is a, a um, compatibility condition between neighboring uh, elements. You want the intersection to be a common phase. So for example, this would not be a triangulation, but this is actually not so important because when you have something like this, you can do something. Some of this and go back to triangulation. You want it to be to be meaningful. So I'm just trying to see if you okay. Yeah. So you want it to cover the one of the space and you don't want uh, it to be too wide. So let's say that uh, locally there is only a number of uh, a finite number of vertices of elements. <laughs> when you write P over D, you mean probabilities? No, it's um, it's subset. Uh, okay, so this is the oh, process. Yeah. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. well, maybe that's the reason why. That's the reason why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're German and you call it potence. I, I thought it was. <laughs> I thought it was. Pass. Pass. Uh, yeah. Pass. Okay, but maybe I'm, there is a bias because it's Italian. So yeah. I don't know. Okay, so once you have a triangulation, you can define CPWL functions, and so these are the higher order generalization of uh, these ways of finds ones. So actually, CPWL stands for continuous and piecewise linear, but they are continuous and piecewise affine, but we didn't choose the name. And uh, so it's not uh, completely our fault. So by definition, a function is CPWL if there exists a triangulation such that the function is affine on each of the elements of the triangulation. And here there is the request that the function is continuous and this is important. So the C is really, is really important. So maybe this is a kind of natural concept. Uh, okay, uh, trivial remark, uh, CPWL functions have locally bounded Hessian shaft and variation, and this is because their gradient is a simple function. And so you know also a bit uh, on uh, how to do the, the computations in this, uh, in this setting. Okay, so uh, one may hope that what happened in 1D also happens in uh, uh, higher dimension. So the, the conjecture that Shayana and Nicole, uh, Michael asked us, so the conjecture that uh, people from the applied community had was that the extremal points of this regularization ball are continuous and piecewise uh, linear or affine, of course, modular affine functions. And uh, it turns out that this is not true. So this is actually a result of our second paper. So in the first paper, we believed that this was false, but we didn't have a proof. But later on, we, we, we had a proof. And so the theorem is that uh, this is uh, not true. But you didn't write the proof and the counter example. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we were lucky because we wanted uh, to just one thing. Uh, slide. Yeah, it was picked out, but I don't remember anymore. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can, there be, can there be some measure concentrate? Because I want to understand where. Is, so take a CPWL function yes. and look at the action. Yes. Me, the me, where is the measure concentrated? On faces, on, on edges, on lower dimensional on points? One co dimensional faces. Only there? Yes, because it's uh, functional, it's functional, functional differential of a BV. Right. Yes. So it's. Uh... Okay, good point. Uh, uh, okay, so we want to prove that the conjecture is false. So we want to find an extremal point that is not CPWL. And we were lucky because the first thing that comes to your mind is to try with the, some cut function. And so the graph is, is this one. So if you add, uh, so assume that you are uh, on the plane. So this is a two. Uh, here there is the unit ball and the cut coin function is this one. So this is its graph. So it's clearly not CPWL function. It's, it's not CPWL, but you want to prove that it, uh, it is extremal. And okay, one, one normalize it in order to have uh, the second order total variation equal to one. So <laughs> this is a dimensional concept that is not important here. Okay, so you compute its uh, second order total variation. It's uh, unsurprisingly, uh, it's one. That's how you choose to go. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, so the theorem is that this uh, is extremal. So this is the answer to the conjecture uh, uh, before. Of course, you have to do in uh, this in dimension greater or equal than two, because we know that in dimension one, this is false. And uh, you want to factor out uh, affine functions because you don't care about them. Okay, 
So if you want to test whether it's extremal or not, you write it as a convex combination with functions that are in the regularization board. And your aim, because you want to see that it's extremal, is to see that this is a trivial convex combination. So to see that F1 and F2 actually equal to the comb function. Now, I don't want to give the full proof, just a bit of the ideas. Uh, so this is your claim. Uh, so the first thing that one does is to take the radial symmetrization or the radial part of this, uh, of this equation, because you notice that the left-hand side is a radial function. So you can average this and have the same, uh, uh, the same equation, but with F1 and F2 replaced by the radial part. But once you take the radial part of a function, the second, its second order total variation can be only smaller. So there is some rigidity here that tells you that still the second order total variation is equal to one. Is so, it obvious? No, I mean, what is, yeah, oh, it's not so difficult, right? You take total variation here, second order total variation, it shows that this is a semi-norm. Mm -hmm. You use that one is less or equal. Ah, than it's the same notion. That's, uh, that's an integration. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Radial path. Yes. I mean, the, you yes. Have... I mean, it's just integration. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Sure. Uh, okay. So you have this. Um, and now this is something that everything here is radial. So you can do maybe a one dimensional computation. It's not uh, completely trivial, but it's uh, rather straightforward. So this implies that the radial parts of the fi are equal to the cut function. But still, this is not enough to conclude because you want to conclude that the fi's are equal to the cut And so you have to uh, think a bit more about this. And uh, what you notice is that the fi, uh, the radial parts are equal to the cut and this is because the point before, the, rest and the, second, the second order total variation is equal to one. And this uh, implies that they are concave in the unit ball. This is not trivial, and I'm not going to, uh, to discuss more uh, about, uh, about this, but we can take it uh, as a black box and see how we can conclude. And so, okay, just with the drawing, we have this fi that are concave. So we have the catcon. The catcon is, uh, there is something radially affine. So they are concave, so they are above the catcon. So we have a point that is, uh, uh, we have a point with inequality between fi and uh, the catcon, but uh, if we take the radial part, we connect to the catcon, so this is an integral equality. So if you combine them, I think uh, you can believe that this really uh, implies uh, uh, what you were. Uh, is it obvious that they have to be zero? At the, uh, uh, yeah, the that's not so, the, yes, because there is no second order total value. Value over there, so it has to be identically equal. Yeah, it has to be a fine, so. Okay, okay. Okay, so this is a, a, a sketch of this proof. Okay, let me sum up what was uh, uh, seen in these slides. So the first is that the extremal points of the regularization ball are not uh, always CPWL. The other way around, it's not difficult to realize that not all CPWL functions that are good candidates are extremal and just take a uh, sum of the average of CPWL functions with subparts that are one far away from the other. And so uh, at this point, it may seem disappointing because it may seem that there is no uh, relation between uh, uh, functions which are treatable and the <laughs> the function that you want to study. And okay, so this uh, uh, brings me to the last section. Uh, so this is the one about the main results of the, of the papers. And here there is a density result, and a priori it may seem a bit unrelated with the discussion before, but uh, I'll show you why this is not the case. So this is the theorem. <laughs> CPWL functions are dense in energy in the space of functions with bounded variation. So let me rephrase it. Uh, if you take a function with bounded variation, then you can find a sequence of CPWL functions converging towards it in L1 and with convergence, uh, second order total variation. Now, okay, this theorem tells only one non-trivial thing uh, because uh, when you have a function with second order total variation that is finite, you may hope to find a triangulation that is uh, 
more and more refined. So you can uh, build a function of, out of this triangulation. So convergence in L1 would be something that you expect. And also you have a lower semi-continuity here. So the only thing that has to be proved is the opposite uh, uh, inequality in, uh, in this limit. Uh, so this was proved in the first paper, but only in dimension two. And the, the proof was a rather constructed, so some sort of fractal construction, self-similar construction. And then we proved it in the uh, general case. Uh, I, I'm not going to, to really to face the proof in this seminar, in this talk, uh, only at the very end that will be a couple of slides about uh, some pictures that uh, said a bit. Just one, just one question. Uh, so one thing comes to mind, someone naturally that if you give me a function, and you ask, please approximate it with CPWL, there's an easy way. I just take a triangulation, fine enough. Yes. I sample at the yes. matrices and I compute the affine blah, blah, yes. blah. Sorry. Is this working or this? No, work? it's not because you are producing a second order total variation that is too big. Do you have an example? Uh, I mean, I yes, I mean, we did the computation, but if you try this, it's very naive. Oh, and... I, start to, I start to see it. But for example, if you have an edge and you approximate not along the edge, you will get too much. You see it. It's there maybe a cylinder and you triangulate so that it's, the but, triangles are very. No, but I, I would take a fine, a, a decent triangulation. But you have, you, in the end, you would have it to refine it uh, a lot. And more or less with every kind of function that you take, uh, if you take this sort of triangulation, you would uh, have something that is too big. Even if it's even for smooth functions. Yes. The problem yeah, is totally. The problem is not about the smoothness. Actually, it's even trivial smooth, to reduce what even with smooth functions. It's, it's trivial to reduce to the smooth function case. Yeah, exactly. And but, so okay, that, that smooth is, functions. If I do a triangulation, in, you know, yes, the regular one, it's not going to be. You would have something that I mean, if you do it really bad. You would have uh, maybe you can convert to something that is not okay. that, that what it means like if you make of course the triangles very like degenerate i, mean, I yeah. definitely believe it but yeah. I, if i make a regular triangulation you're just telling me it doesn't work yeah it, if i make like a you know hexagonal you want yes it won't work it would be some lattice, no it, it won't work maybe uh what you can do maybe you you do like this you do the most natural thing so you have this yeah, and you and can you take this. Yeah, and, for instance. Uh, you will have something that is uh, uh, bigger, bounded by a constant, times this, but bigger. But wow. even if f is smooth. Yes, it, that's not, that's, wow. that's not, you need that smooth to be, to, to do this computation because uh, these functions are a priori not continuous, so you want to evaluate. Right, so you want to have something smooth, but that is without loss of generality, you can always yes, smooth I mean, and then approximate. Yes, uh, but uh, that's, I mean, you're going to have something that is, uh, bounded by a constant times the things, but you just, you can do the computation with a quadratic function, I think, or maybe we, uh, we did it, but it was really a bit of straightforward. You bound it by a constant times it, but you see that this kind of sort of sharp. And given a function, because you maybe find a triangulation that works better. That's the That's the proof. Uh, I, I mean, if it worked like this, it would be really disappointing because it required quite a lot of work, but I don't think really it really works with a random triangulation. I mean, only with, also with that one. It does not work. Uh, okay. It might, of course, it might mm -hmm. work with a random triangulation because maybe, I don't know, there's a probability argument which is saying, like, you know, for most triangulations, you pick. Yes, uh, maybe it can be there instead set of triangulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, but, uh, yeah. but you're just telling me if I take a no, 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 it's not working. No. You can make this visit computation. You want to have some cancellation in the computation and the cancellation will see later. The cancellation is given is only if you do it in our sense. Okay. Uh, okay, so the, this was the theorem. And uh, why do you say it's dense in energy? In energy, yes. because uh, density should be, uh, I mean, with density, I mean density this, and in energy, I mean that you can approximate also the energy. So, okay. so you, you do produce the triangulation? Yes. Uh, sort of explicit. In, the, in 2D, yes. In uh, higher dimension, uh, we, have, we say that you have to choose some points, and there is a major theoretic argument that allows you to choose these points. So we do not do the triangulation explicitly. 
Okay, so first, uh, let me tell you why this is useful for the study of the problem. Of, of the problem. So take an extremal point for this set. So this is really what we want to see. Then there is a sequence of CPWL functions that are also extremal points. And I'll tell you why, but this is a, a, an interesting set and this is something that uh, people from the applied community are happy to deal with this. And okay, so the fact is that uh, you converge to it in L1. Okay, F and FJ are extremal points. So the second order total variation is one. So of course, also the second order total variation are converging. But the fact is that you can approximate an extremal point with extremal points that are also CPWL. And uh, this is uh, a reasonable set. And okay, just uh, a simple example, again with the cut cone. And uh, as I told you, the cut cone is extremal. So what you do, if you have this, you want to approximate it, so you can do like this. And then uh, you will have uh, pyramids. Uh, and these pyramids, uh, when you let this, uh, this size go to zero, so you take pyramids with the uh, uh, bigger and bigger number of sides, uh, uh, we converge uh, in energy here. Yeah. And you can see that these are extremal because uh, for extremal points that are CPWL, it's, uh, it's manageable. Okay, I want to sketch the proof and the fact, the reason why is because it's short given the uh, density result. So this is simply convex analysis. So let me denote the regularization ball in this way. So now, uh, I think that you can believe that if you put the right topology, you're going to have a compact set, and this is due to the compactness of the sublet embeddings, which of course modulo affine functions. So you have a convex compact set, and it's a good framework to do convex analysis. OK, the first thing, uh, uh, I'm not going to prove this, but take it as a black box. This is not trivial. And so this tells you that the CPWL functions in this set can be given by convex hulls of CPWL extremal points. The fact that this is non-trivial is that here appears the CPWL word. Because if there is no CPWL, then it could be. Uh, this is actually the, the, the main point of what you want. Uh, this is more or less, yes, uh, this is there. Uh, uh, but uh, no, I mean, you, you need uh, also the density design. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, OK, so let me take the closures. Uh, so I take here, there is the closed convex hull. And here there is the closure of this set, but the closure of this set is the whole B, and this is because of the main density. So the, the first point is not obvious because CPWL is not a linear space. CPWL, it is a linear, it is a linear space, space but uh, a priori extremal CPWL points can be too few. There's one question. You because, uh, sorry, you can express a function like this as a convex combination of extremal points. But nothing tells you that okay. it's, 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 it's linear, but it's not close to the yes, yeah. that you're choosing. That's the point. Yes. Your work, do you actually classify CPWL? Yes, and then that's the ah. going to be written here. I, I guess that's how you prove that point. Uh, more or less, yes. I'm, it's going to be the same. It's, OK, just wait a second. OK, then uh, there is, now it's a uh, convex analysis, so it's Karim Milman. I think you, you, you knew what uh, I, I was going to write here. And so this is uh, the theorem before, right? I take an extremal point and I approximate it with CPWL uh, extremal ones. OK, this is how, this is why this is something that uh, um, Shayan and uh, Mikkel were, uh, were happy to have. And this is the fact that you have an algorithm to check whether a CPWL function that is a candidate to be extremal because you want its uh, second order total variation to be one is uh, extremal or not. So it is extremal, say G is extremal, if and only if for other uh, function H such that its second order total variation has support contained in the one G, then H is a multiple of your starting uh, function. So in other words, uh, this says that the CPWL, fun uh, CPWL extremal functions are the ones uh, whose the second order total variation is minimally supported. So you cannot find an non-trivial one with uh, support included uh, in it. Uh, actually, this does not give the first point, but the argument used to prove this, just is easy to answer to Federico, uh, is the one used also to prove this. It's a kind of perturbative argument. Uh, uh, 
uh, H, maybe it's obvious that it will be, but in your statement, it doesn't have to be a CPW. It does not have it to be, but it will it turn out to be, right? B, because, because it has to be supported on the face. Yes. 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 Where the measure is needed. All oh, right. Yes. There, there's no, yeah. Then it's, so, yeah, yes, there's not much. But, uh, but oh, I mean, but the fact is that, for example, there are CPWL functions, so take this. Uh, let, let me do a very trivial example, just uh, because I don't want to do mistakes. And so in this case, uh, I'm safe. So take this pyramid, okay, take another one. Okay, so this is the function. This only, considering all it is, is a CPWL function, with, uh, and this computes the second order total variation, the support of it is contained in the one of uh, H sum. So this is not extreme and uh, Oh yeah, but you knew that this was not because the support is going to contain yes. the diagonals of the square. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so only this, only this is extremal. But if you sum them, you, you know that it's not extremal. But this theorem uh, tells you that uh, your trivial intuition is uh, is right. Uh, but of course, uh, this has to be uh, applied to more complicated situations. Okay. Uh, so just just a question. So the, the theorem that you showed at the very beginning is kind of effective because it tells you the number of uh, extremal points that you're using is a finite number. Right? Yes, I mean the theorem. Adds... How is it here? Is it is it is it yours also effective or uh, actually the theorem that was really at the beginning has to uh, be stated under suitable assumption and of course we just we were just in the mathematical part so we didn't check that it's. Really if you can make it effective. Yeah, but it was just to give you the motivation why they, that, that was the story, more or less, not the rigorous part. Okay, so we have this. Uh, so uh, I prom promised you why, uh, that I'm going to tell you why. It's good to take the, sec the shutter norm and not the usual uh, Frobenius one. And uh, okay, uh, this uh, is uh, maybe an explanation why the density result would clearly fail uh, <coughs> with this choice. So the first thing to know is that if a matrix has a rank one, then uh, the two norms coincide and they are what you, what you expect. Then if you take a CPWL function, then, okay, by having finite second order variation, it's uh, gradient is a BV function, but it's actually an SPV function and its second order variation is concentrated on, on uh, one codimensional uh, uh, Sets, so these are the one codimensional phases of the simplex class. So you take the polar decomposition of its second order uh, derivatives and the polar matrix would have rank one. Uh, you can say you can see this as a as the easy part of Alberti's rank one theorem, but in this case it's a computation. So it's but so that kind of explains also intuitively what can go wrong with the with triangulation. So if you're using the Hilbert Schmidt norm, you you're not converging in energy with, with, with no, you're not. You because, I mean, because, because, because you can you, you would have actually been approximating say a parabola with uh, uh, another measure which only has rank one okay uh, actions. So there's going to be some loss in the you can see it like this, but also like uh, okay, this is going to be made easier. So the outcome is that uh, for CPWL functions, the, you can compute the second order total variation with respect to your favorite norm and you will give you a difference. But then assume that uh, a density result with respect to the mm -hmm. uh, Frobenius norm holds. Yeah, then, then the Frobenius norm would be equal to the... Yeah, would be greater yeah. or equal. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, what this is... They are different. Mm -hmm. But they are different and if you are interest only, interested only in matrices, you have the opposite inequality that can be strict, for example, for the identity uh, matrix. And so this will be a contradiction. So the density result cannot hold if you take the Frobenius norm and that, and you see with this argument that uh, with many other norms, it cannot hold. Okay, that, that makes me believe that even for the sharpened norm, if you are not very careful, your triangulation is, is maybe converging to something. Wrong. Yeah, but having this result for the Frobenius norm would be maybe too strong. Yeah, result because you have a recheck okay. theorem and uh, you can approximate them in energy with every norm. So, uh, reasonable. Okay, just a bit of hints towards the proof of the main density uh, theorem. 
So let me re restate it in this way. So for a function with bounded action, you can find CPWL functions converging in it in energy. And uh, okay, this is the global version, uh, not the local one that I stated before, but they are in the same. Okay, so just maybe this, I think this is, okay, this is the last slide with, uh, with text. So a couple of trivia remarks. Uh, I've already discussed this. So the second order of total variation decreases under modification and is lower semi-continuous. And so uh, we've discussed this before all together. So you know that uh, there is no loss of generality assuming that your starting function is smooth. Okay, so you have to build a, a CPWL approximating sequence. So what you do is you build triangulations and then you interpolate. That's the only thing that I think it's reasonable to do. And okay, so you have to build good, good triangulations that will give you functions. And you, are only, you only care about this inequality because the other one is uh, even by lower, lower semi-continuity. And of course, you will have convergence as soon as these triangulations are finer and finer. And okay, so two facts uh, that maybe are linked to the question before. Okay, so assume that you are in R2 and you have two orthogonal directions, then you can draw a grid like this. So the grid is aligned with the directions, and then you can take this triangulation. So this, so having an orthonormal basis of uh, the plane or of the space gives you in a natural way a triangulation that is aligned with this, uh, with this grid. And the fact is that if you align the triangulation in the direction that are the eigenspaces of the action of F, you would have a contribution of the second order total variation in the approximating function, in the approximating sequence, that is the one that you want to have. So, think that this is a smaller or equal. But if you do not do like this, you would have something that is greater. And if you do the computation with, I mean, with a dense set of function, you would uh, see that uh, uh, you really mess some, something. You maybe can have the reverse bound if you do it in a way that is not too stupid, but the reverse bound with a constant. So you, take, you don't mean if you, if you take a paraboloid, the paraboloid is special because you have the you no no with two different with two different uh, like say x one squared plus one half x two squared. Uh, well, the action has the eigenspaces that are still uh, one one half. So if I do the triangulation like no no the, 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 the triangulation I... only cares about directions, not about lengths. So this is gonna be this is going to be a wrong triangulation, right? But the fact is gonna be wrong because it's <coughs> yes. Okay, so if it's tilted. It's not it good. is like 45 degrees instead of being like, it's not, you know, good. It's uh, not good. It's not good. And for the parabola, it should be some good example, I think. I don't remember, but I suspect that it's going to be. Well, example. if all that matters is the, uh, is the uh, eigenspaces, then yes, that yes. one has two different. Yes, maybe it's special. The parabola, maybe it can be lucky, but I don't think. I think that in this way, you're going to fail. But I'm a bit confused. Because like there, for example, there are three directions, but we only have two again. Oh, this is uh, this is uh, you can do la you can do this or you can do also this. The only thing that matters is that you are consistent. This is the third direction. That is the this one. You don't care it. You don't care. Oh. You don't. I mean. No, I understand what you said. I'm just very surprised that you need a condition that is like many of the edges are par parallel to the eigenspaces, but not all. But this is perfectly, uh, if you look to this, uh, this is a square. Look at this. Uh, this is a square whose sides are parallel to the eigenspaces. And then you just triangulate it. But uh, it doesn't, you, don't, you do not care about this. Yeah, so you're saying the, there's very little of the derivative which is lying in there. Yes, in the end, these, uh, I, as far as I remember, are not going to produce uh, Much relevant contributions. The contribution comes from this. I think that this is a lower order term. Maybe, uh, I don't recall well, but I think that that's true, these uh, are lower order. Uh, okay, so the other reason is, uh, is not good. So maybe the picture that you want to have in mind is that uh, you want to have uh, these, you want to divide the space in uh, 
regions, in regions in which the action is more or less constant because you are you have a smooth function. Of course, you have to take care of this, but on each region, you draw a grid aligned to the eigenspaces of the action. And the fact is that uh, these grids are not uh, are rotating, and so you want to match them. And that's the, the, the hard part. So what uh, uh, we did, uh, I draw it in dimension two, but it's in, uh, actually, this works in higher dimension, is to, to instead of taking grids, take the vertices, so the intersection points of the grid in the square, take the standard lattice outside, and then you would have to find a way to put some vertices here to join the things well and to decide which vertices are the ones that you have to join to get the elements. But the, the, the technical part. So, okay, this was what I wanted to say. So, thank you. Questions? So, uh, I didn't, uh, so you probably said it, but I didn't get it. So, if you wait, instead of one norm, take the two norm, you know that you just know, sit here and it's false? Yes. Okay. It's not only that the proof doesn't work. No, 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 the theorem is, uh, it can't be true. Uh, I think that uh, if you take a paraboloid, uh, it's going to fail. Uh, I, so I actually think that if you do it on the paraboloid, right? Like say it's x1 squared plus two x2 squared. I actually think that the derivative on the diagonal of the square is going to be zero. Like, you know, the affine function is simply translated over here. You're claiming that on each square? Uh, because it's x2 squared, it's actually it's, affine. Yeah, because it's x2 squared that would explain plus 2x1 squared, right? So when you're just going over here, you're just taking the, link, the, the parabola that we had before and you're just simply raising everything by a constant. I, mean, I can do the computation on a single square. Yes, I think so. I think it gets it's lower, it's lower or better. The diagonal ones are uh, going to get. He's claiming that for, for, for the parabola. Yes. Exact parabola is yes. at zero, which would explain why it's lower order when you actually have a smooth function. So it will depend on the, like, you know, the continuity, essentially. Of right, the it's just fine on the, ah, okay. It's fine, and you just ah, have to say yes, it. Yes, yes, no, it's so you actually, your, your additional yes. edge is not introducing any yes. discontinuity. It's directly fine on each, on each piece. Exactly. Yes. I mean, after all, everything is set similar. If it weren't equal to zero over here, I think you would just simply get a non-negative contribution by, by rescaling everything, right? I was, not, I was not seeing that it was actually zero on the diagonal. I never see it. Yeah, but you see then if you pick up the wrong... Yes. If you pick up the wrong guy, it's always adding some non-trivial some non contribution. So that, that might actually give you an intuition why yeah. the wrong yes. triangulation. But I think that the, the, the real, what is... More important is that you want to have the right contribution on the on the good on the good sides, and also also in that one you you really see that uh, you have a cancellation effect only if you take the right contribution. No, no, now I see. Now I mean uh, the theorem is unexpected because there is this magical cancellation. But now I see. It. Yes, it's, it's it's unexpected. Yes. Well, if you just think that you yeah, just take a triangulation and everything would work. Well, okay, maybe. I mean, just because with one derivative, everything would work, whatever you do. Yeah, yes. But, <laughs> well, that's maybe in one that's, I mean, maybe, no, no, with one derivative, yeah, everything okay. would work. Oh, right? okay. It doesn't, doesn't depend on the dimension. If I do it with one derivative, it would work. I mean, I, 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 mean, I mean, okay, so I can really make something wrong if I make the triangulation very yeah, skewed. What you don't but if I'm just computing the first derivative, it really is not going to matter okay, what okay, triangulation yes. I use. I mean, like, like you know, oh, the rotation wouldn't, wouldn't see any problem if I just... Mm, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's because you're taking the second derivative, which uh, seems so crucial. Uh, given the proof and more or less what you said, one may, may believe that this density theorem uh, can be true only for norms that are fundamentally uh, the nuclear one. When I say fundamentally, I mean you can give different weights to different, uh, different uh, what do I want to say? You, you can put some weights for sure. Weights uh, where? Like you have your eigenspace. Uh, your eigenspaces and you put weights on the directions 
and then you so use that way. Isotropic, uh, yes. But okay. And that, and I think that your proof would work exactly the same. Uh, That's why I mentioned this. Uh, but it seems to me that one may believe that this is the only. Okay, for norms that coincide on rank, I mean, on rank one matrices, uh, I think that uh, maybe most of norms coincide. Ah, because oh, everything will. You can do the same proofs, uh, the same proof. Uh, so the rank one matrix has just one eigenvalue and all the others are zero. So you want to, if you want it to be reasonable, you have to find a norm. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. So, but this is not, it's not true that it's important, it's important only the value or the value. No, it's not important. But uh, the fact is that uh, if you have a norm that coincides with the Schotten one or rank one matrices, uh, then the density result is going to fail. Yes, sure. OK. And I think that what I said, I would say something very false. Uh, then what I said may be true. Yeah, for it may same, work. For it the same work. reason that you just mentioned. It may work. Because it's true. And for rank one, rank one, like whatever norm you take, you might find a, a, way, to, a, way, a way to choose the weight that it coincides with what you chose as a norm on all rank one functions. Or all rank one matrices, and then the argument applies. I might be saying a, a huge amount. Of okay, I don't know. Maybe they were they were interested with something that was isotropic because of the nature of the problem. So we didn't even investigate the isotropic stuff. Okay. Is it conceivable that if you try to do instead of second order, the same thing with third order, it's actually always going to fail? I we have an idea. Because it seems that it's absolutely fundamental that you have this eigenspaces, right? Yes. I mean, this kind of um, the base, which is diagonalizing your Eschen. And I would sort of expect that if you're trying to like, you know, look for the same structure, uh, third order, for the third order polynomials, you're not going to find it. Right? I mean, right. you're never going to find something which like, you know, splits the third order Taylor polynomial in something nice, right? I mean, like, like I mean, there's always going to be clusters, no matter which uh, which so, basis. Uh, I use. think that yeah, if it works with third order, it's going to be something very different. But something something like that could be somewhat easily checked because, after all, it would be sufficient to check it for cubic stuff, yeah, cubic polynomials, yes. and it would be sufficient to check it for a single simplex because what you want is that the density that you find there coincides with the actual integral of the, like the, the area of the thing, maybe divided by two. And then you can do the computation. And most likely, if you choose the right cubic, whatever it means to be the right cubic, you will not be able to find a simplex. Where which which trust them. Yeah, yeah that is like, I mean, it sounds, it sounds plausible, given how important it is that you actually have uh, a basis where you can write your quadratic form into the sum of the quadratic forms on the single direction. Yes, in the end, you're using that uh, on regions. You are, uh, interp you are interpolating the function, but you can pretend to interpolate the second order Taylor polynomial. So, right. Yeah. Which then you can write as sum of independent functions yeah, yes. on, the, on the. Yes, so it, and you, the second order polyno Taylor polynomial would be a model of fine things. Some sort of par paraboloid, but you are choosing right the, the basis. Of course, that's not what you really end up doing because if you interpolate the Taylor polynomial in each region, you're going to have something that is discontinuous. So it's going to be annoying. But if you just want to think about the computation, it's a good way to do this. Okay, there does not seem to be any further questions. So.